Hi, my name is James Griffiths. Welcome to another video. And today we're going to look at Peter Gabriel, his first four albums. And what's prompted this is me finally finding a copy of his second record, which I've been looking for literally for decades. Uh, so uh, this is the album uh, informally titled Scratch and I picked this up at my local market traders a couple of weeks back and uh, this is an album that I'd never owned on any format and I don't think I'd even heard it all the way through. Like I said, I've been looking for it for a long time. We'll go through the first four albums in order in a moment but I just wanted to quickly show you the order in which I um, found them to show you what the disparity is. So the first one I ever found was Peter Gabriel, uh, the first album which was uh, informally titled Car, uh, but we'll get to that momentarily. And I would have picked this up back in probably the early 1990s. The first Peter album I heard was So, I mean that was the big huge crossover pop record I suppose wasn't it but um, after that I you know knew who he was so I remember getting that one from Cobb Records in uh, in North Wales back in the day and then this one this was years later absolutely years later they are surprisingly difficult to come by uh, this was the third album and uh, that was the next one I got this would have been maybe about five years ago I picked this one up this one I think was last year or maybe the year before. This is the fourth album which was released in the States under the title Security, even though really it's just Peter Gabriel again. And then like I said, this is the one that I found in the last couple of weeks, Scratch. So um, really pleased to add that to the collection. So I figured now would be a good time. I've just been listening to all these albums in order. So they're all fresh in my mind again. So I thought it would be good fun just to go through them, see what I think of them, give you a little bit of history about them and try and put them into some kind of context. And uh, so that will be good fun. So um, obviously Peter Gabriel had had this um, pre-solo career in Genesis between I don't know, 1971 and 1975. He left Genesis in the summer of 75, and so this was the last album that he appeared on, obviously, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And I think it's important to listen to this album before you listen to the Peter Gabriel solo albums, because I think, in a way, this record did lay down the template for what he was going to do as he went solo. The first four Genesis albums, or the first three or four, they've got this kind of whimsy about them. Think of those album covers, you know, Foxtrot and Nursery Crime. And the music on the record, on those records, there is a bit of darkness coming through, definitely a bit of spooky Victoriana, but Genesis was a very particular thing. You had the very florid keyboard magistry of Tony Banks, and they were a progressive rock band, essentially. Peter Gabriel, I think, had a slightly different approach to things. His approach reminds me a little bit of Robert Fripp, and I think Fripp and Peter Gabriel were quite, had quite a lot in common in the sense they both jumped off the prog rock ship uh, when they saw the iceberg coming. Peter Gabriel jumped off Genesis, and then they did do some good stuff, but by 1976, punk had broke, and Genesis was starting to look distinctly passé. And Peter Gabriel, I think he used some of the... Some of the strangeness and some of the darkness on this album. Not all of this album works, it's quite indigestible in places, but you get the sense of an artist, Peter Gabriel, I think, straining against the constraints of the prog rock Genesis template, where it was always it was always going to be about Tony Banks's florid keyboard work and um, he needed to get out essentially. So the first solo record he made came out on the 25th of February 1977. So there was a bit of a gap. He left Genesis in August of 75. This came out in February of 1977. I think it was a bit of a surprise for people. He decided to uh, go with Bob Ezrin as the producer. And Bob was not really the obvious choice of Peter Gabriel in some ways, in some ways. I mean, he'd done Kiss, he'd done Alice Cooper, so I suppose he did have... Actually, yeah, he did have a kind of art rock background, but he also had the big American arena rock sound going on, and that wasn't something that people had associated with Peter. Um, it made for an interesting mix, certainly. This album got to number seven in the UK, got to number 38 in the US, so, you know, a reasonable hit album for him. 
featured um, Steve Hunter on guitar, who was, uh, I think he was a Bob Ezrin associate, he'd been on, uh, on some of the Alice Cooper records. Um, Robert Fripp on guitar, so Fripp and Gabriel lost no time in uh, teaming up once Gabriel had left Genesis. Tony Levin on bass, and of course Levin was going to be uh, a long time associate with Peter. The London Symphony Orchestra are on this record as well, and um, a real mixture of stuff. In my mind, the album always starts with Salisbury Hill, which was this beautiful acoustic, folky kind of song, which was really a song about his own experiences of, of deciding to leave Genesis and free himself from the shackles of the music industry. Wonderful song, absolutely beautiful. And it, see, it, it feels like an opening track, but in fact it's not. The opening track is Moribund, the, Bergam the Bergamizer, which is a classic kind of quirky Genesis style, strange, unnerving art rock track. I always wondered whether he put that on the start of the album as a kind of joke in a way, you know, let's start the album with a very Genesis type song and then move into Salisbury Hill, which was a kind of anthem for his liberation from Genesis. Um, so, yeah, and then the album continues to veer around. You've got some... Really, really nice songs, actually. Humdrum at the end of side one, I think, is a gorgeous track with some very atmospheric flute playing from Peter. Uh, again, you know, Shades of Genesis coming through on that. Um, Modern Love, which is a bit more of a big arena rock sound. And then on side two, you've got these couple of tracks which are quite strange. Waiting for the Big One sounds like he's trying to channel the spirits of Randy Newman or the Great American Songbook. It's quite jazzy. Um, but again, you know, if you if you if you listen back to, to you know some of those Genesis albums that Peter did, uh, you know there were some strange left turns on those records as well. Down the Dolce Vita is um, sounds a bit like uh, I don't know Eye of the Tiger or something. It has a real kind of American arena rock sound. But then the album ends with Here Comes the Flood, which is a classic Peter Gabriel Zippo's aloft kind of moment. Great big epic song. I think. I'm not sure Peter was that happy with this record. I think he felt it had been overproduced. And to my ears, it sounds like him casting around, trying to find an identity and trying on different identities, trying on different versions of himself to see which one might fly. Uh, but the Bob Ezrin production is interesting. It's quite a vibey production and not really like anything he was to do after that, really. By the way, the cover, the car on the cover was owned by um, Storm Thorgson from... Um, uh, from Hypnosis, which I thought was quite uh, quite a nice little um, twist. Right, so then, uh, the year later, he loses no time, goes back into the studio. By the way, that first album was recorded in Toronto, and then there was some subsequent work done at Morgan and Olympic in London. Uh, the next album, he went to the Netherlands uh, to Relight Studios, and... Um, this is Peter Gabriel again. It became known as Scratch because of the cover. This one came out on the 2nd of June, 1978, and this time he's got Robert Fripp producing. Got to number 10 in the UK and 45 in the US, so uh, didn't do quite as well as the first album. And um, this album sometimes gets a bit of a bad press. Having only just really sort of started listening to it in the last couple of weeks, I think it's better than people say it is. It's not very... It's not very Fripp-like. I mean, Robert Fripp was going to go on to pioneer certain quite ahead-of-its-game style, uh, you know, 80s production in the 1980s. Uh, you know, think of tracks like Frame by Frame from Discipline. But on this album, I don't think Fripp maybe had quite seen into the future yet, and this album sounds more like a 1970s effort. Uh, it's well produced, but there's no big sonic idea behind it. I think that's the problem with it. If it is a problem, I th I, you know, I do think it's quite an enjoyable album with some really strong material. I love the dystopian um, imagery, this strange, dark character stumbling through these streets, which look to be full of um, foam or something. And then the inside cover, you've got some nice imagery on there. Well, not nice imagery, again, quite disturbing dystopian imagery and this I think does tie back to the stuff he was doing on The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway that album is a bit of a psychodrama you know I think John Carpenter was a fan of that record in fact there was some talk of Peter teaming up with him I think wasn't there but I'm not sure anything came of that anyway back to Scratch so you got some really strong tracks on this DIY the second song on side one has got a real pumping vibe to it and then Exposure on side two has got a great groove it's not much of a song but it is a great groove and then Home Sweet Home at the end of the album is a really, really dark song about a man who's, um, whose wife jumps out of an upstairs window with their child. It's not made 
crystal clear if she died or not, but it's certainly quite a dark, tragic kind of song. And um, Peter's writing on this album, I think, gets a little bit more close to home. You know, he starts referencing things like dirty dishes in the sink, which had always been a thing with him. He'd always had this clever way of bringing domestic details into the art rock arena you know think of I know what I like in my wardrobe he was really clever at doing that and um, on this album he's definitely doing it so um, I don't think it's a bad album at all maybe of the four it's probably the least adventurous but I certainly don't think it is bad in any sense so uh, that was Scratch 2nd of June 1978 then there is a gap um, his next album doesn't come out until the 30th of May 1980, so he's into the 80s now, and this is the third album, again called Peter Gabriel, uh, this one is called, um, is subtitled Melt, with another great uh, hypnosis cover, really, really great artwork there, and a nice moody shot of Peter inside, we've got another inner, uh, which is quite colourful and quite interesting. I mean, he always thought visually, didn't he, as we know, you know, later on when he did the Sledgehammer video, and he was always a visual artist anyway, you know, back in the Genesis days and all his costume changes, he definitely explored the potential of the visual arts. This one, 30th of May 1980, and this was his biggest album to date, got to number one in the UK, got to number 22 in the US, and this teams him up with the production team of Steve Lily White, the producer, and his engineer, Hugh Padgham. So he's messing with the big boys now. Stephen Hugh obviously pioneered this incredible 80s sound, which uh, took lots of people into hitherto unexplored areas of their career. You know, great sound. A sound of its time, definitely, but um, when you... You know, the artists who knew how to harness it did really well with that sound. Maybe McCartney, less so on Press to Play. Even that has its moments, but... Um, Anyway, this album, this I think is where Peter Gabriel's true sound really started and it coincided with the beginning of his interest in African music, world music, whatever horrible um, phrase, but you know, he was the guy that pioneered WOMAD and that started to happen around this time. He started to become more political. There are some songs on this record which have you know, definite cultural, political themes. Uh, big range of people on this album. You've got Phil Collins and Jerry Marotta on drums. I know Jerry was, I think Jerry was a drummer that Hugh Padgham had used before, and he was going to go on to use him again, actually, on Press to Play. Phil Collins and Jerry were told not to play any cymbals on this record. It was a thing that, for some reason, Peter decided he wanted to go down that um, avenue. I think they found that quite interesting. So, um, And, of course, this is the album where the gated drum sound first gets invented. A complete accident. It was a compressor that they were using on the talkback system in the studio, and uh, they just happened to hear either Phil or Jerry playing a snare drum through it one day by accident and they just had this incredible gated sound which does bear a resemblance to the drum sounds on the Bowie albums you know think of Low and Heroes so you know some of that stuff sort of had been done before but this had a kind of 80s there was an 80s touch to that drum sound and uh, it became incredibly influential Great roll call of musicians on this album. Larry Fast on synths doing a great job of playing some very, very uh, of their time sounds, but really classy sounds. Paul Weller turns up on And Through the Wire uh, with his very abrasive jam style guitar sound. Dave Gregory uh, from XTC is on I Don't Remember and Family Snapshot. Kate Bush turns up singing backing vocals on No Self Control and the big hit single Games Without Frontiers, which I think, let's have a look, I think that was his highest charting UK single to date, got to number four. I think Sledgehammer got to number four as well. The other single, of course, was um, Biko, which was about the South African anti-apartheid campaigner Steve Biko who had been murdered by the authorities in South Africa in back in 1977. So that was Peter really showing his hand in terms of being a political songwriter who was not afraid to start dealing with some pretty major issues. And that was, I think he was kind of riding the zeitgeist really in the 1980s in that respect. Games Without Frontiers as well, obviously, had a very political slant to it. And um, the album just has this very original sound, quite airless sounding um, starting to hear ethnic sounds coming through and it's very very different from his first two albums the album was actually rejected in the states originally atlantic who was peter's american distributor didn't think it was going to sell so they rejected it so in the states originally it came out on mercury 
And then a couple of years later, I think Geffen then brought it out. And by then, I think they were a subsidiary of Atlantic. So Atlantic ended up releasing it in the end anyway, once they'd realised their mistake. But um, in England, it came out uh, on uh, the usual Charisma label. And it, this one's got a really, really nice custom label, which I will quickly show you. So we've got the... Let's have a look at both sides. We've got a bit of a face melting thing happening on both sides. Wonderful imagery, which really exactly matches the music. That was what was so um, enticing, I think, about Peter's albums. You always got the sense that there was a kind of integrated aesthetic going on between the visuals and the music. And that carried on with the fourth album, which uh, again is just called Peter Gabriel, although Geffen Records actually did call it. They actually released it in the States under the name Security. I think that's how it's now listed on Spotify as well. So this one, this album came out in 1982, released on the 10th of September, so a couple of years break again. Got to number six in the UK, got to number 28 in the US, so a bit of a dip from the previous album, but uh, he's still doing pretty well. Let's have a look at this one. So again, we have an inner with some quite interesting um, visuals there, this kind of infrared thing going on. God only knows what the... Uh, what the image on the front is meant to represent, no idea about that, but there's a certain kind of horror film, almost like a sort of Aphex twin aesthetic going on there. And uh, again, a bit of a custom label. You know, talking of the Aphex twin, I think these two albums, this one and the previous one, Melt, I think they were extremely influential. You know, later on in the 90s, I was listening to music and there are sounds on those records which sound like they'd been modelled on sounds from this period of Gabriel's career. I would even go so far as to say that they were probably digital synths invented in the 80s where there were certain patches on those synths which were designed to try and replicate some of the kind of ethnic African-y kind of sound that he'd started to get. Anyway, this one is uh, one of the earliest digital albums, uh, featured the Fairlight synth, which was a tool that was going to become absolutely huge in the 80s in the hands of people like Kate Bush and Trevor Horn, of course, was the biggest exponent. This album was recorded uh, in Bath uh, at Peter's home studio, I think, although I don't think it was called Real World at this point, but uh, he stayed close to home for this one. Big roll call of musicians again, although not quite as impressive on the last album. You've got Tony Levin again, Jerry Marotta and Larry Fast again, and Peter Hamill from uh, Van de Graaff Generator turns up on a few tracks on this record. Quite a strong political thing coming through. The track Wallflower, which is, I think, a real highlight of Peter's career, is on side two of this record. Incredible chorus on that. But that was about the treatments of political prisoners in Latin America in the 1980s. San Jacinto was a comment on the indigenous Americans being overwhelmed by, uh, by the white Americans. So again, you know, that sort of cultural thing happening in his music, quite, um, quite political. This album, he had his first US hit with Shock the Monkey, uh, which is possibly the most poppy thing on the record, actually. Uh, but um, yeah, I think my favourite track is Wallflower. Another quite airless production, the first couple of tracks are very slow, Rhythm of the Heat and San Jacinto, they've got this sort of brooding African kind of vibe to them, and um, touches I think of what he was going to go on to do in So, I think if you listen to Wallflower you can hear touches of what he was going to do on say a track like Mercy Street on So, starting to develop the more melodic side to his personality which had always been there but um, it's definitely starting to sharpen up on this record. And of course after this he went on to not ditch the art rock exactly but he found a way of turning it into a more commercial proposition and of course with, with the release of So in 1986 um, he became a big, big major star. And I think in a way, I think he painted himself into a corner by that point. I think Peter Gabriel, his first four albums have this great sonic inventiveness to them, or the second two anyway, anyway. Melt and Security have that. But I don't think he ever really bettered Melt and Security in his new album, which I've heard. It's good, but I think as Norman Masloff was saying, it's, it doesn't really do anything new. There's a, I think there's a sense that in the late 1970s and early 80s, he invented his own aesthetic and... Um, once he'd become a huge major star, I think when he wanted to go back to doing interesting left field work again, there was nowhere really to go except back to the kind of sounds he'd been doing uh, on those albums. So 
anyway, a bit of a sidetrack there. So I hope you enjoyed that. Just a quick look at Peter Gabriel 1 through 4, and uh, let me know what you think of those albums. I'm not going to try a ranking. That would be very unwise. So, uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.